This is the second thermal physics lecture. In this lecture we're going to be looking at expansion of solids. We're also going to be looking at kinetic theory and the ideal gas. The textbook reference for this lecture is The Fundamentals of Physics by Halliday Resnick and Walker and it's sections 18.3 and 19.1 to 19.2. So last lecture you were introduced to the zeroth law of thermodynamics that said if body A was in thermal equilibrium with body C and body B was in thermal equilibrium with body C, then bodies A and B were in thermal equilibrium with each other. We also mentioned that heat always flows from a warmer body to a cooler one. You were introduced to the concept of absolute zero, which in classical physics is where all motion ceases, but actually some other stuff starts to happen around that temperature. And you met this equation which tells you how the length of a solid changed as it was heated. This is just an approximation, remember. The change in length of a solid is equal to alpha, which is the thermal expansion coefficient, times the initial length, times the change in temperature. Next in the lecture, we had a demo. You were asked to think about whether situation A or situation B would happen. In A, both the inner radius and the outer radius expand as a metal's heated. In B, as the metal's expanding, the inner radius contracts and the outer radius expands to take up all the increased volume. What we observed was that as we heated a steel bore in a copper ring, Copper has a higher thermal expansion coefficient than steel. As we heated it, the, it, was, it became possible at a certain temperature for the steel ring to pass through the copper, which told us that the copper was ex expanding this way. The hole was actually getting bigger. So this tells us that we can use the equation, the change in radius is equal to alpha times the initial radius times the change in temperature for both the inner and the outer radius. Both expand as something is heated. Okay, now we're going to derive, we've looked at linear expansion, now we're going to consider the expansion as volume changes. As you know from high school, or possibly primary school, the volume of a rectangular prism is given by the length times the width times the height. So the final volume as we heat this rectangular prism is going to be given by the initial volume plus the change in volume. So this term here shows the final volume and the final volume is equal to the final length, the length plus the change in length, times the final width, the width plus the change in width, times the final height, the height plus the change in height. Okay, so the change in length is given by alpha times the initial length times the change in temperature. Same thing for the change in width, but with a W, and same thing for the H, but with an H instead of the L. Now, each of these, we can pull L out as a common factor here, W out as a common factor here, and H out as a common factor here. So we'll have L, W, H, and then when we pull those out, we've got 1 plus alpha delta T left for each of these cases. So there's three of those, so that's cubed. So we've got length, width, height, 1 plus alpha delta t cubed. And so now we want to expand this. To expand this, we can use Pascal's triangle, which tells us that the coefficients out the front are 1, 3, 3, 1. So we've got 1 plus 3 alpha delta t plus 3 alpha delta t squared plus alpha delta t cubed. Now, this was only a linear approximation, so it's wrong to include squared terms in cubic terms. As it was a linear approximation, that meant that Previously, we were ignoring squared terms. So it would be actually incorrect to start including squared terms now because there would be other terms that we're not including which are of an equivalent magnitude. Le length times width times height is just the initial volume. And we ignore these because it's incorrect to include them. Also, alpha delta t is a small number, much less than 1. So alpha delta t squared is even smaller. Alpha delta t cubed is very, very small, so we ignore these. So we've got, this is the initial volume times 1 plus 3 alpha delta t. So the initial volume plus the change of volume is equal to the initial volume plus 3 alpha delta t. And so the change in volume 
we can write this way, which is just equal to 3 alpha delta T times the initial volume. Now, for metals, we generally present alpha as a linear expansion coefficient because it makes sense to think about a metre of a material. And so if we're given a linear expansion coefficient, we can work out how the volume changes using this formula here. However, for some things such as liquids, it doesn't make sense to have a linear expansion coefficient because what would a metre of water look like? It's, it's not really a very good concept. So instead we have a volume expansion coefficient, beta. So 3 alpha is equal to beta. And what you're given really depends on whether something's a solid or a liquid, but you can convert between these two. Something for you to try is show that for a rectangular plate, the change in area is equal to 2 times alpha times the initial area times the change in temperature, A is the surface area in this case. Okay, a problem. When the temperature of a copper coin is raised by 100 degrees C, its diameter increases by 0.18% to two significant figures. Give the percentage increase in A the area of the face, B the thickness, C the volume, D the mass of the coin, and E calculate the coefficient of linear expansion of the coin. Okay, so in this problem we have a coin with a certain diameter D, a certain thickness, certain area and a certain volume and we're told that the change in the diameter is equal to 0.18 percent. Now we know that the change in the diameter is equal to the diameter times alpha delta t and so we can write that delta d on d is equal to alpha delta t. Now part a of the question asked us what is the change in the area of the face. So we need to calculate the change in area over the area. Now we you, you need to show as an exercise that the change in area is equal to 2 alpha a delta t, initial a. And so the change in area over area is equal to 2 alpha delta t which is 2 times, this is alpha delta t, so it's 2 times this. So this is 2 times 0.18%, so that's equal to 0.36%. Okay, in part B, we were asked about the thickness of the coin. The thickness is just a one-dimensional thing, so the thickness change will be the same as the diameters change. The delta t over t will equal delta d over d, which will be alpha alpha delta t which is 0.18 percent. Next we were asked for the change in volume delta v over v very similar to this except that the change in volume we showed was equal to 3 alpha v i delta t and so this is equal to 3 alpha delta t which is 3 times this which is 0.54 percent. Question D asked us what's the change in mass. Well, we're not changing the amount of matter in the coin, so we're not changing its mass. No mass change. And then in part E, we were asked to calculate alpha. So we'll need to use this. So let's use this part. We've got 0 0.18 over 100 is equal to alpha times, we were told that the change in temperature was 100 degrees. So alpha is equal to 0 0.18 over 100 squared, which is 0 0.18 times 10 to the minus 4. We could also write this as 18 times 10 to the minus 6 if we wanted to. And we should give units, so this is per Kelvin. Per Kelvin. Or per degree C, it doesn't matter. Okay, so for a liquid, we write delta V is equal to beta VI delta T rather than the 3 alpha. Most liquids expand as they are heated. Water is actually a bit of an exception. As it's heated above 4 degrees, it does expand as we expect. So this is why on a hot day, if you get in the pool, there's a warm layer of water on top. 
that water is the warm water expands it's then less dense and so it floats on top of the warm the cold water so warm water up the top and cold water down the bottom water behaves differently below four degrees c between four degrees c and zero degrees c it actually expands as it gets colder so if we have a pond which has been cold for a few days so it's come to equilibrium at four degrees c and then it continues to cool down the cooler water is actually less dense and so on a cold day the really cold water comes to the top when it's on the top it then gets down to zero degrees c and so we get ice forming on the top and the ice then floats on the top and stays there forming a barrier between the atmosphere the cold atmosphere and the rest of the pond this is actually very lucky for fish because it means that there's still water down the bottom of the pond that they can use to swim around in. Otherwise the whole pond would freeze solid and that would be a very bad thing for fish and also wouldn't be very good for the oceans. Okay, so finally an example. We have an aluminium cup with a 100 milliliter capacity. It's completely filled with glycerin at 22 degrees C. How much glycerin, if any, will spill out of the cup if the temperature of both cup and glycerin is increased to 28 degrees C? Okay, so here we have our cup. We've got 100 milliliters. This is aluminium. This is glycerin. So the initial volume is equal to 100 milliliters. Okay, now in the question we're told that beta for the glycerin is equal to 4.85 times 10 to the minus 4 per Kelvin and that the alpha for the aluminium is equal to 24 times 10 to the minus 6 per Kelvin. Now the temperature goes from 22 degrees C to 28 degrees C so the change in temperature in both cases is 6 degrees C. Okay, so let's work out the change in volume of each of these. The change in volume of the aluminium is equal to 3 alpha times the initial volume of the aluminium times the change in temperature. So this is 3 times 24 times 10 to the minus 6 times 100 times 6. And solving that on the calculator, we end up with... 0.0432 milliliters. That's the change, the units are milliliters as this was in milliliters. The change in volume for the glycerin is equal to 4.85 times 10 to the minus 4, the beta, times the initial volume, which was 100 milliliters, and then times the change in temperature, which is the 6 degrees. Doing that on the calculator, we end up with 0.291 milliliters. So the change in volume of the glycerin is larger than for the aluminium. So the spillage will be the difference between these two. It'll be 0 0.291 minus 0 0.0432. Solving that, we end up with 0 0.2478 we should just give our answer to two significant figures, so 0 0.25 milliliters of glycerin will spill. Now a concept that you need to be aware of is the moles concept. The amount of gas expressed in moles is equal to the mass of the sample divided by the molar mass for that sample. So the molar mass will depend on what molecules are making up our sample. In one mole of a material there are Na, Avogadro's number of particles, so that's 6.022 times 10 to the 23. We can find out the atomic masses or molar masses off the periodic table. It's presented as a little number underneath each of the elements. If you come across a problem in the homework set or in the quizzes, you will need to use the periodic table to look up the atomic mass and use that to get the molar mass. In an exam, you'd be told the molar mass or the atomic mass. There are a few atoms that are always found as diatomic molecules 
in the atmosphere on, and around us on Earth. There's seven of them, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. You should try and remember that these ones are always found diatomic, so two molecules, two atoms joined together, and so the molecular mass is double the atomic mass. So you've seen this formula for pressure before. Pressure is equal to force over area. This equation explains why if people are wearing stilettos, they tend to mark the floor. The area is very small, so the pressure is very large, and so they're more likely to leave an indent. Also, if we leave a Coke can in a hot car, then the pressure inside increases, which means the force on the walls of the Coke can is large, and so this can cause the walls to buckle, as shown in this picture. So let's have a look at an example where we may use this formula. What pressure would you experience two meters under the water? Here's our water surface, and here's our swimmer two meters under the water. So the swimmer has a volume of water on top of him. This volume is equal to the surface area A times the height which is two meters and we know that the pressure on the swimmer is equal to the force over the area. Now as well as the weight force from this mass of water pushing down on the swimmer. We also have the atmospheric pressure which is acting on the surface of the water here. So that continues to act on the swimmer. That doesn't suddenly stop acting as soon as you go underwater. So plus the atmospheric pressure. So the force acting is equal to the weight force which is equal to the density of the water times the volume of water times g. So this is equal to the density of water times the height, which is the 2 meters, times the surface area times g. So let's substitute that in. The pressure is equal to rho h a g on a plus the atmospheric pressure. So these a's will cancel out and so now we can substitute in. The density of water is 1000 kilograms per meter cubed. The height, that's the 2 meters of water acting on him, and G is 9.8. One atmosphere of pressure is 1.01 times 10 to the 5 pascals. So solving this on the calculator, we end up with 1.21 times 10 to the 5 pascals. Or if we want to give that in atmospheres, it's equal to 1.2 atmospheres. So it's important to always remember to add in the atmospheric pressure that is acting on something. We can consider gas molecules microscopically. And from this we can calculate the pressure and the force exerted on a wall. Imagine a gas particle colliding with the wall. We're going to make the assumption that the kinetic energy is conserved. So the initial and the final velocities have the same magnitude. Now in the vertical direction, the y direction, the velocity is not changing. So the initial y component is the same as the final y component. You'll remember that the impulse equation, force times time, is equal to the change in momentum. So we can write force is equal to the change in momentum over time. The change in momentum, the mass isn't changing, so it's just a change in velocity. Now, in this equation, we can leave off the vertical components, as in the vertical direction, the velocity is not changing. In the horizontal direction, the velocity is changing. The initial velocity is in the opposite direction to the final velocity. They have the same magnitude, but the opposite direction. So Vfx is equal to minus Vix. So if we replace this Vix with a minus Vfx, we'll end up with 2m Vfx on t. So this is the force that one particle exerts on the wall. We'll be coming back to use this again later. If you want to practice with this equation, try homework set 4, question 4 for 1121, or question 5 for 1131. Active figure 19.12 shows us what happens when we change the temperature and the pressure of a gas. In this active figure that can be downloaded from Moodle, 
In this top one, we're keeping the temperature constant at 300 Kelvin. You can see that as we increase the pressure, the volume of the gas decreases. So we can increase the pressure by applying a force to the piston that will increase the pressure. In the second example down here, we're keeping the pressure constant. So the easiest way to keep the pressure constant is to not apply any force to this piston. It's then applying a constant pressure onto the gas. If we then decrease the temperature of the gas, the volume changes. The relationship between pressure and volume was first noted by Boyle, so it's given the name Boyle's Law. You don't need to remember that law, but you do need to know that pressure is inversely proportional to volume. We saw a few examples of this in the lecture, one where we had a balloon in a flask. As we evacuated the flask, decreasing the pressure, the volume of the balloon increased. Charles's law relates the volume and the temperature. Volume and temperature are linearly proportional and we saw in a lecture that when we poured liquid nitrogen onto a balloon decreasing its temperature the balloon shrunk so the volume decreased with the temperature. Guy Lussac came up with the relationship between pressure and temperature. As we increase the pressure the temperature increases and vice versa. Now we can combine all these laws into the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law can be written as PV is equal to nRT. This satisfies all three of those equations. In the ideal gas law, n is the number of moles of the gas and R is the universal gas constant. R is equal to 8.314 joules per mole per kelvin. Now it's a good idea to practice using this ideal gas law. If you go to homework set 4, Phys 1121 students should try questions 3 and 5, and Phys 1131 students should try questions 4 and 6. Now PV equals NRT is one way to write the ideal gas law. This is a useful way to write it when we have a, around about a mole of a substance. If we have a lot less of a substance than that, then there's a more useful way to write this equation. The number of moles of a substance is just given by the number of molecules divided by Avogadro's number. So R over Avogadro's number is just a constant in this case. Those are both constants. So R divided by Na is actually given a special name. It's called Boltzmann's constant and it's equal to 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. So we can write this ideal gas law, replacing the R on Na with Kb, as PV is equal to NKBT. The capital N means the number of molecules, the little n means the number of moles. So this form is more useful when we only have a small number of molecules. Either form should give you the correct answer. If we're considering a sealed container, then the number of moles is not changing. So we can write PV over T is equal to either NKB or equal to NR and we can say that both these things are constant. So if that's the case then if we have any initial pressure, volume and temperature we can work out the final pressure, volume and temperature at any time. Pressure, temperature and volume are often called macroscopic properties of the gas. This comes about because they're easy to measure. Here's an example question. A bottle of cold water at 5 degrees C is taken from the fridge. The lid is removed and replaced and then it's left in a car on a hot day. The temperature of the bottle reaches 75 degrees C. Assume that the expansion of the bottle in the water is negligible. What is the pressure of the gas in the bottle now? Okay, so we're just going to use the ideal gas law. PV is equal to nRT. And we were told that the initial temperature was 5.00 degrees C. Then we took it out of the fridge and we took the lid off and put the lid back on. What that tells us is that the initial pressure is one atmosphere. So when we took the lid off, the pressure equilibrated with the atmospheric pressure. The final temperature after it's been left in the car is 75.0 degrees C. 
and we need to find the final pressure. So we have PV over T is equal to NR, which is constant. So P initial, V initial, T initial is equal to P final, V final, and T final. And we're told to assume that any expansion of the liquid or the bottle is negligible. So that tells us that the V initial and the V final are the same, so we can cancel them out. So the final pressure is equal to the initial pressure over the initial temperature times the final temperature. Now it's important when we're using this equation to instead of using degrees C, we need to convert into kelvins. So this is one atmosphere times the final temperature, which is 75.0 plus 273.15 over the initial temperature which is 5.00 degrees C plus 273.15. You'll need to type all that into your calculator and we end up with 1.25 atmospheres. So it's fine to answer in atmospheres as long as we make it very clear that we have answered in atmospheres. It would also be possible to answer in pascals. If you want to convert your answer to pascals, you need to times it by 1.01 times 10 to the 5. So this gives us 1.26 times 10 to the 5 pascals. Question. A balloon with a volume of 3.3 litres on the surface is taken 15 metres below the surface of the freshwater lake. What is the volume of the balloon at this depth? You may assume that the gas filling the balloon is ideal. Also assume that the lake is at thermal equilibrium and the balloon is at thermal equilibrium with the lake. So we know that we've got some So we know that we've got some balloon here. It's got a volume of 3.3 liters and it's taken below the surface of the lake to a depth of 15 meters and we're asked what's the volume down here. Let's call that volume 2 and call this volume 1. We know from the ideal gas law that since it says that they remain at thermal equilibrium with the lake, so we'll assume that the lake's got the same temperature on the surface as the bottom, which as we learnt below, before would mean that it was 4 degrees C, so let's just make that assumption. We know that P1V1 is equal to P2V2, and so V2 is going to be P1V1 on P2. So what we need to do is work out the pressure down here. So the pressure down there is going to be the atmospheric pressure which is pushing down on the surface of the lake. So that's just caused by the Earth's atmosphere. And so that's 1.01 times 10 to the 5 pascals. That's one atmosphere of pressure. Plus we're also going to have the force over the area. Now the force acting on the balloon is the weight of the water above it. So this will be mg and m is going to be equal to rho times the volume which will be rho times the surface area, the cross-sectional area times the depth, let's call that d. And so we have that this is equal to 1.01 times 10 to the 5 plus the rho which is a thousand because it's fresh water times, well, the A up there will cancel with the A down here. So times D, which is the 15, times the G, which is the 9.8. And so working out this pressure, we have 2.48 times 10 to the 5 pascals. And so V2 is equal to 1.01 times 10 to the 5 over 2.48 times 10 to the 5 times 3.3 litres and solving that we get 1.3 litres.